In this week's block of scripture we're studying is Mosiah chapters 25 through 28. We'll take a look at some of the doctrines and principles that are taught and how they apply to us and can help us in our lives. So with that, let's begin with chapter 25 through 28, an introduction, a small introduction. Many of the rising generation rejected the testimony of their fathers and led some church members to commit many sins. See Mosiah 26, 1 and 6. As a result, Alma sought the Lord's guidance on how to deal with members of the church who broke the laws of God. He also prayed that his own son might be brought to a knowledge of the truth. The answers to both petitions provide valuable teachings for us today. We learn the manner in which priesthood leaders must admonish those who commit serious sin and help them through the repentance process. We also see the need for all mankind to be born of God in the story of Alma the Younger and the four sons of Mosiah. Through your study, contemplate how accepting the atonement of Jesus Christ leads to repentance, full conversion, and the desire to labor for the salvation of others. Let's now begin with Mosiah chapter 25. 25 verse 2, people of Zarahemla. When Mosiah the first led the more righteous portion of Nephites northward from the land of Lehi-Nephi, about 200 BC, he found on the west bank of the river Sidon a city inhabited by a people whose language he could not understand. They were ruled by a king named Zarahemla. When the two races developed the ability to communicate, it was discovered that the people of Zarahemla were the descendants of a colony which had been led by the Lord out of Jerusalem in the year when the city was destroyed by the king of Babylon, 587 B.C. After wandering in the wilderness, they were brought across the ocean and landed in the Americas. In the years that followed, they migrated southward to the place where they were found by Mosiah. Because they had brought no scriptural or written records with them, their language, society, and spiritual nature had all developed or become corrupted. The person Mulek. Mulek was the son of Zedekiah, king of Judea, who was preserved when the rest of his brothers were slain by the king of Babylon. It is quite probable that because of the lineage, Mulek was appointed the king of the wandering colony of which he was a part. Through this colony, the blood of Judah was dis destined to be mixed with the blood of Joseph in the Americas. Remember, the Nephites and Lamanites are from the tribe of Manasseh and Ephraim. Mulek is from the tribe of Judah. So that's how part of Judah gets over here in America. Chapter 25, verses 5 through 11, the phrase, The Power of the Scriptures. In Mosiah 5, 25, 5 through 11, Mosiah caused the scriptures to be read to the people. The following list shows the effects that the scriptures had on the people. One, they were struck with wonder and amazement, verse 7. Two, they were filled with exceedingly great joy, verse 8. Three, they felt sorrow for the death of so many, verse 9. They recognized, number four, the goodness of God, verse 10. Verse number five, they felt the need to give thanks to God, also verse 10. And six, the sin of others filled them with pain and anguish, verse 11. I would dare say that reading the scriptures today can have the same effect upon us as we take a look at our society and see the spiritual death of so many who are unwilling to follow the prophets and scripture. Chapter 25, verse 12, the children of Amulon. See Mosiah 23 through 5. Amulon was one of King Noah's priests who undoubtedly took an active part in the martyrdom of Abinadi. When Noah was burned to death by his enraged subjects, Amulon was among those who fled into the wilderness, having abandoned their wives and children for fear of their own safety. These ignoble priests then kidnapped some Lamanite maidens whom they took with them into the wilderness wanderings. The Lamanites, supposing that their daughters had been taken by this, those of the city of Nephi, then attacked the Nephites, which resulted in the loss of many lives. Later, 
the priests made an alliance with the Lamanites and were made rulers over Alma and those of the city of Helam. Their brutality and injustice caused Alma's people to implore the Lord to deliver them. Ashamed of the actions of their forebears, the posterity of Amulon and his fellow priests now chose to be known no longer by the name of their fathers. Thus they took upon them the name of Nephi. No one wants to bear a name that had been dishonored. Their actions typifies that which is to happen in the world to come. Those whose fathers have no place in the kingdom of God will, like links of a chain, be removed, while their righteous seed will unite themselves with those of their progenitors worthy of that honor. Chapter 25, verse 13. The citizenry of Mosiah's kingdom consisted of a union of Nephites and Mulekites. Though the Mulekites were more numerous, they chose to call themselves Nephites. Chapter 25, 15 through 17, the phrase preaching unto the people, repentance and faith on the Lord. Though we are told that Alma's message was faith and repentance, we are also told that he taught many things. Majestic mountains are but a home for all manner of foliage and animal life. Even so, the towering doctrines of faith and repentance provide a terrain natural and conductive to the teachings of all the truths of salvation. In order to teach faith and repentance, one must also teach all the principles of salvation, sacrifice, obedience, the atonement, consecration, justification, sanctification, etc. Chapter 25, verse 18, the phrase, As many as he did baptize did belong to the church. Those worthily baptized attained through this ordinance membership in the church and the citizenship in both the earthly and heavenly kingdoms of God. As Jacob pointed out in his discourse on the doctrine of Christ, baptism is the gate into God's kingdom, meaning the celestial kingdom. Chapter 25, verse 19, the phrase, gave him power to ordain, ordain priests and teachers. Mosiah obviously held the keys of the kingdom, that is, the right of presidency rested with him, and Alma could take no action in, in organizing various bodies of the church except under his direction. Chapter 25, verse 22, the phrase being many churches, they were all one church. As there was a unity of doctrine among all the churches in Zarahemla, so there had been a unity of doctrine among all the churches in all times and in all dispensations. It is not to be supposed that the church did not previously exist in Zarahemla, but rather that because of the great increase in its population, it was now necessary to divide the church into various congregations. In modern terms, we would think in terms of making wards and state divisions. Let's now go to Mosiah chapter 26. 26 verses 1 through 2. The phrase, the rising generation did not believe. President Henry B. Iron of the First Presidency emphasized the need to teach the youth of the church to believe in God. Quote, no, church, no charge in the kingdom is more important than to build faith in youth. Each child in each generation chooses faith or disbelief. Faith is not an inheritance, it is a choice. Those who believe King Benjamin learned that. Many of their children chose later not to believe. The scripture gives a reason, for they would not call upon the Lord their God. End of quote. Speaking to the youth of the church, Elder Jeffrey R. Holland of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles explained why older church members mentor those younger than them. Quote, so much that we do in this church is directed towards you, those whom the Book of Mormon calls the rising generation. We who have already walked that portion of life path that you are now on try to call back to you something of what we have learned. We, should in, we shout encouragement. We try to warn of pitfalls or perils along the way. Where possible, we t try to walk with you and keep you close by our side. End of quote. When a generation of young people grows to maturity without a proper doctrinal foundation, whether because of parental ne negligence or through rebellion on the part of the youth, then a foundation has indeed been laid, a foundation, unfortunately, for faithlessness and immorality. 
Such appears to have been the case in the days of Alma. The rising generation grew into adulthood without a tie to the theology of their parents. Without that saving and settling witness of the Savior in his gospel, which had been the focus of the teachings of King Benjamin. Thus, the need and the commandment in chap, Doctrine and Covenants section 58 verse 25 for parents to teach their children to understand the gospel. Not to know, but to understand. Understand means being converted in their heart, not just having a knowledge. 26 verse 3, the phrase, because of their unbelief, they could not understand meant those given up to a spirit of doubt and unbelief could not know the things of God. The mysteries of the kingdom of heaven are made known to those who have a believing disposition, those who are diligent and obedient in keeping the commandments. Search diligently, pray always, and be believing is the divine injunction with the attendant promise that all things shall work together for your good if you walk uprightly and remember the covenant wherewith ye have covenanted one with another. Chapter 26, verses 4 through 5, the phrase, they were a separate people as to their faith. That is, they did not associate with the people of God. By extension, they did not associate with the things of God. They chose a course which alienated them from the things of righteousness. Contention and dissension are of the devil, particularly when fostered by members of the church. They rob people of the influence of the Spirit of the Lord and strengthen and facilitate the designs of Lucifer and his minions. Thus the command to not have contention. We can discuss different doctrines and have differences, but we are not to contend. Also, contention means contending those who contend against the doctrine. That also causes contention, that they are in contention with the doctrine and teaching false doctrines. Chapter 26, verses 6 through 7, the phrase, it became expedient that those who committed sin that were in the church should be embodied by the church, the meant. Those called to serve as shepherds of the Lord's flock in all ages bear a weighty burden in regarding to admonish the church in the paths of righteousness. The common judges, those set apart to sit in judgment upon transgressions, are duty-bound to confront sinners and invite them to repent and come unto Christ. That would be bishops and stake presidents who are common judges in Israel. When sins go unchecked, the spirit ceases to strive with the church as is as it might. The spirit of God, stated George Buchanan, would undoubtedly be so grieved that it would forsake not only those who are guilty of these acts, but it would withdraw itself from those who would suffer them to be done in our midst, unchecked and unrebuked. And from the present of the church down, throughout the entire ranks of the priesthood, there would be a loss of the spirit and a withdrawal of his gifts and blessings and his power, because of their not taking the proper measures to check and expose their iniquity. This is why we have to, from time to time, hold church courts and to keep the church clean and pure. President John Taylor delivered the following penetrating counsel, quote, I have heard of some bishops who have been seeking to cover up the iniquities of men. I tell them, in the name of God, they will have to bear them themselves and meet that judgment. And I tell you that any man who tampers with iniquity will have to bear that iniquity. And if any of you want to partake of the sins of men and uphold them, then you will have to bear them. Do you hear it, you bishops and you presidents? God will acquire it at your hands. You are not placed in position to tamper with the principles of righteousness nor to cover up the infirmities and corruptions of man. What a heavy weighty responsibility upon the judges of Israel. For if they do not act in their calling to uphold righteousness and wink, so to speak, at sin and do not hold sinners accountable, then they have to bear those people's burdens of sin. What a heavy responsibility. Chapter 26, verse 7, the phrase, delivered up unto the priest by the teachers. Reference to priests and teachers in the Book of Mormon should not be confused with the office of priest 
or of the office of teacher, as known to us in the Aaronic priesthood today. In all dispensations, it is the duty of those called to bear the priesthood to watch over the church always and be with and strengthen them and see that there is no iniquity in the church, neither hardness with each other, neither lying, backbiting, neither evil speaking, and see that the church meet together oft and also see that all church members do their duty. The Nephites did not function under the Aaronic priesthood with the law of Moses in America because there were no Levites. There were just the tribe of Joseph and Judah here. And so Lehi would have held the Melchizedek priesthood. And so they would have functioned under the direction of the Melchizedek priesthood. So when they refer to priests, they're probably referring to high priest and teachers. They're talking about those who are set apart to teach the doctrines of the gospel. Chapter 26, verses 8 through 12, the phrase, Why did King Mosiah decline to judge church members? After King Mosiah, as king and prophet, gave Alma authority to establish churches throughout the land, it seemed natural for Alma to bring the disobedient church members to Mosiah to be judged. The king, however, having de delegated priesthood authority to Alma, indicated that Alma was responsible for dealing with those who transgressed the laws of the church. Mosiah retained the judgment of those who broke the laws of the land. 26 verse 13, the phrase, he feared that he should do wrong in the sight of God, refers to. It is a weighty matter to sit in judgment upon transgressors. Truly, as Joseph Smith taught, quote, none but fools will trifle with the souls of men, end of quote. Lacking the certainty of experience, Alma here sought the confirmation of revelation. Chapter 26, verse 14, the phrase, after he had poured out his whole soul to God, meant there are moments that matter, occasions when a supplicant is poignantly aware of the need for divine direction. Though we are continually dependent on the light of heaven to illuminate, illuminate our paths, there are occasions that require a sure answer, occasions in which we pour out our whole souls in prayer. We implore with an intensity and petition with a passion. Even our master at the time of his great testing prayed more earnestly. Alma wanted to know and do the right things of the sinners in the church, that he pours out his whole soul into God to know what do we do with those who will not repent. The phrase, the voice of the Lord came unto him, was, as it was with Enos and with so many others, after mighty prayer and supplication, after they had cried unto God all the day long, the voice of the Lord came. The united testimony of Scripture is that those who seek diligently will, in reality, find. So Alma finally did get the voice of the Lord to direct him in governing the affairs of the church. Chapter 26, verses 15 through 16. Indeed, blessed are those who give heed to the words of the prophets and apostles, for in doing so they hearken to the voice of the Lord himself. Blessed are you, the Lord said to a group of elders in the latter days, who are now hearing these words of mine from the mouth of my servants, for your sins are forgiven you. The Lord's condemnation appears to center in the willingness of Alma to accept Abinadi's words, and those baptized at the waters of Mormon to accept the testimony of Alma. They did not require the additional testimony of a second witness. Special blessings occur, a, a cure to those who accept the word of the gospel without stubbornness of heart. Chapter 26, verse 17, the phrase, they shall be my people. The Lord's church is made up of his people if they are called by his name are built upon his doctrine, and show forth works of righteousness befitting him. 26 verse 18, the phrase, Who are willing to bear my name, refers to, Entrance into the kingdom of heaven requires that we take upon ourselves the name of Christ. Salvation is found in no other name. The significance of this proclamation is worthy of careful consideration. How is it that the power of salvation is vested in a name? Be it remembered that Christ, in his mortal ministry, was careful to establish the fact that he came in his Father's name, that all his works were done in the name of the Father, and that he sought to glorify the name of the Father in all that he did. 
Thus the Son assumed the name and power, and maybe we say authority also, of his Father. And through the name, and by that divine investiture, authority, he extended the promises of salvation to all who would take upon themselves his name, as he had taken upon himself the name of his Father. Such is the system of salvation. Taking upon ourselves the name of Christ, another way of saying that is taking upon ourselves the authority authority of Christ. In Christ's name, there is Christ's authority to perform his saving action upon us if we are faithful. Such is the order and pattern in heaven. God, the eternal Father, placed his name upon Jesus of Nazareth, his only begotten in the flesh, and by doing so doing, testify that the Galilean was his own son, that the love and protection of heaven would be with him. Christ, a rightful heir to the dominion, power, and glory of his Father, was empowered to act in the divine nature. In turn, the Savior invites all his earthly brothers and sisters to return to that heavenly family of which they were once a part to take again the family name and become heirs of the blessings associated with it. Thus, salvation centers in our accepting Christ as our Savior, being born again into the family of the Father through the waters of baptism, and living worthily of all the ordinances of the house of the Lord, wherein we are endowed with the powers of heaven. Those rejecting such, like the rebellious children in the families of men, will be disinherited from the royal family of heaven and left to seek citizenship in some other kingdom. Well, there's only one other kingdom to get citizenship in, and that is this kingdom of Satan. Chapter 26, verse 20, the phrase, Thou shalt have eternal life. The Lord declared that Alma should have eternal life. The prophet Joseph Smith outlined the process by which one obtains this promise. Quote, After a person has faith in Christ, repents of his sins, and is baptized through the remission of his sins, and receives the Holy Ghost by the laying out of hands, then let him continue to humble himself before God, hungering and thirsting after righteousness, and living by every word of God. And the Lord will soon say unto him, Son, thou shalt be exalted. When the Lord has thoroughly proved him and finds that the man is determined to serve him at all hazards, then the man will find his calling and election made sure. Then it will be his privilege to receive the other comforter which the Lord had promised the saints as recorded in the testimony of St. John. End of quote. Because Alma hungered and thirsted after righteousness, because he had been willing to sacrifice all things for the Christ, cause of Christ, even his own life, and because of his ceaseless efforts to lead others back to the eternal presence of the ordinances of salvation, God swore to him that salvation was secure, that his calling election had been made sure, that the highest of eternal rewards would be his in the world to come. The phrase, Thou shalt serve me meant this seems less a command than a prophecy, a statement of the integrity and thus the fidelity with which Alma would operate his life thenceforth and forever. Chapter 26, verse 21, the phrase, He that will hear my voice shall be my sheep. My sheep hear my voice, the shepherd said, and I know them and they follow me. And to those engaged in the missionary labors the last days, the Lord said, You are called to bring to pass the gathering of mine elect. For mine elect hear my voice and harden not their hearts. To hear the word of the Lord, whether by the mouth of his servants or in holy writ, is to hear the voice of the Lord himself. See Doctrine and Covenants 1834 34-36. He told them, As you are reading his words, you are hearing my voice. The phrase, and him will I also receive, referred to. This phrase affirms that Alma did indeed hold the keys of the kingdom, that which he sealed on earth would be sealed in heaven, that which he loosed on earth would be loosed in heaven. Whosoever sins he remitted on earth and would be remitted eternally in the heavens, while those sins he retained on earth would be retained in heaven. Chapter 26, verse 22, the phrase, Him will I freely forgive. The Lord of life is eager to remit sins to those who come unto Him and join His church through repentance and baptism. 
And speaking of the Savior's readiness and willingness to receive those who receive him, Nephite wrote, quote, He doeth not anything save it be for the benefit of the world. For he loveth the world, even that he layeth down his own life, that he may draw all men unto him, whether he commandeth none, wherefore he commandeth none that they shall not partake of his salvation. End of quote. Chapter 26, verse 23, the phrase, It is I that hath created them. This reference to the creation of man is another illustration of Christ speaking by divine investiture of authority, meaning speaking on behalf of the Father. Through Isaiah, Jehovah speaks, Thus saith the Lord, the Holy One of Israel, I have made the earth and created man upon it. Similarly, in a modern revelation, Joseph Smith was told that Jesus Christ is the life of men and the light of men, and that the worlds were made by him, and that men were made by him. It is true that Jehovah assisted by noble and great ones, creating the heavens and the earth and all things upon it. When it came to the creation of man, however, the crowning creative achievement, there was a change in creators. In the spirit and again in the flesh, man was created by God the Father. So in places where it says Jehovah created man, he's just speaking in first person in behalf of the Father. It is Heavenly Father and Heavenly Mother who created man spiritually and physically, Adam and Eve, here upon this earth. Chapter 26, verse 24, the phrase, if they, knew, if they know me. To know the Lord, one must serve him, obey his statutes, and keep his commandments. He must enjoy the guidance of the Holy Spirit such that he comes to think and feel and act as the master. Straight is the gate, a modern revelation explains, and narrow the way that leadeth unto exaltation and the continuation of lives, and few there be that find it, because ye receive me not in the world, neither do ye know me. But if ye receive me in the world, then ye shall know me, and shall receive your exaltation, that where I am ye shall also be. This is eternal lives to know the only wise and true God and Jesus Christ, whom he has sent. I am he. Receive ye therefore my law. To know Christ and the Father is to become like them, to become one of them. It's not just having a knowledge of their favorite color. No, it is to know them and to become like them. So when it says we are to know them, that means we are to become like them. Elder Joseph B. Worland of Quorum of the Twelve Apostles explained how we can know the Lord. Quote, we can choose to know the Lord by reading the scriptures every day, by communicating with him in fervent prayer at least morning and night, and in times of trial every hour or more if needed, and by keeping his commandments. Remember, hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments is a liar. And the truth is not in him, but whoso keepeth his word, in him verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby know, know, know we that we are in him. Brothers and, selves, do not, brothers and sisters, do not deceive yourselves and think, well, I'm not active, I don't go to church, I don't keep the commandments like I should, but I still love the Lord. No, if you love me, the Savior said, then keep my commandments. If you do not keep the commandments, then you do not love God or the Savior. It is that simple and clear cut. Thus, those who come to know, truly know the Lord, will come forth in the first resurrection and have a place at his right hand. Chapter 26, verses 25 through 27, the phrase, When a second trump shall sound, then shall they that never knew me come forth. Those who do not care to know the Lord, those who flaunt their iniquity, profane his name, and do despise, dis, and do despite the gift of grace, shall not be known of the Holy One at the time of judgment. These shall not be identified, called up, or claimed by him who is the captain of the soul. These refuse the redemption to a higher glory that might have been theirs, have been theirs through acceptance of Christ and single-minded obedience to laws and ordinances. Having been released from hell through the sound of the second trump, the announcement of the second resurrection or 
resurrection of the unjust, these shall have part in that kingdom of which the revelation speaks. They shall be servants of the Most High, but where God and Christ dwell, they cannot come worlds without end. These are those who will inherit the telestial kingdom, having spent their time in the spirit world in everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. In other words, those who inherit a telestial glory or kingdom will not be resurrected until the end of the millennium. During the millennium, they must spend their time in hell suffering for their own sins because they would not take the opportunity and use the atonement in this life. Chapter 26, verse 28, the phrase, He that will not hear my voice, the same shall not receive into my church. Membership in the church is more than a badge of belonging, more than conformity to socially accepted standards. It is a sign of one's commitment to the Lord and his gospel, an evidence of his willingness to take and put on the name of Christ in very deed. Only persons willing to abide by the terms of the baptismal covenant, those willing to come forth with broken hearts and contrite spirits, and witness before the church that they have truly repented of all their sins, those who have a determination to serve the Lord to the end, those willing to bear the burdens of discipleship, should be received into the church of Jesus Christ. Chapter 26, verses 29 through 30. The phrase, confession of sins. Confession of sins is required as part of the repentance process. The Lord declared, by this you may know, if a man repenteth of his sins, behold, he will confess and forsake them. In True to the Faith, a gospel reference, we read the following description. Quote, confession, he that cover his sins shall not prosper, but whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. Essential to forgiveness is a willingness to clothe, disclose fully to your Heavenly Father all that you have done. Kneel before Him in humble prayer, acknowledging your sins, confessing your shame and guilt, and then plead for help. Serious transgression, such as violation of the law of chastity, may jeopardize your membership in the church. Therefore, you need to confess those sins to both the Lord and his representatives in the church. This is done under the care of your bishop or branch president, and possibly your stake or mission president, who serve as watchmen and judges in the church. While only the Lord can forgive sins, these priesthood leaders play a critical role in the process of repentance. They will keep your confession confidential and help you throughout the process of repentance. Be completely honest with them. If you partially confess, mentioning only lesser mistakes, you will not be able to resolve a more serious undisclosed transgression. The sooner you begin this process, the sooner you will find the peace and joy that comes with the miracle of forgiveness. End of that quote. Chapter 26, verse 29, the phrase, according to the sins which he has committed, refers to, punishment and judgment must always be according to the nature of the offense. No two sinners are exactly alike. The circumstances of the transgression, the events leading up to the deed, and the quality and depth of contrition all differ from individual to individual. And thus it is the leadership of the Lord's kingdom can never provide more than general guidelines or principles in dealing with transgressors in the church. All matters must be carefully weighed, evidence carefully sifted, and a decision prayerfully made. The Lord knows what is best for his children, especially his errant children, and the burden of responsibility to determine the divine will in those matters rests squarely on the shoulders of the common judges. And may I add, as they receive revelation from Christ and the Father. Chapter 26, verse 29, the phrase, repenteth in the sincerity of his heart. True repentance entails more entails more than sorrow for sin, more than disgust for the offense, and more than fear of social ostracism. It consists of a knowledge that one has offended his God, has said it not divine counsel, has strayed from the straight and narrow path. When a person repents in the sincerity of his soul, he does all in his or her power to make amends, is eager to receive whatever judgment the Lord and his earthly servants feel should be meted out, and pays whatever price is necessary to return to full fellowship. The sinner in no way seeks to set the terms of the probation or to temper the justice or punishment required by the sin. His heart is an open book. There is no shame 
no hypocrisy, no duplicity. 26 verse 30, the phrase, As oft as my people repent, will I forgive them. Though God's power to forgive, like his power to love, is infinite, it was not Alma's intention to suggest that we could continuously break the same law under the same guise of repentance. Repentance is a thing, declared Joseph Smith, that cannot be trifled with every day. Daily transgression and daily repentance is not that which is pleasing in the sight of God. What, meaning, daily transgression and daily repentance of the same sin over and over. We daily repent because we daily commit different sins. He's not talking about that. He's talking about the same one constantly over and over. Chapter 26, verse 31, the phrase, ye shall also forgive one another. If ye will forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will forgive you for also forgive you, the Savior promised. But he warned, if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. It is not our right to withhold forgiveness. To do so is to assume the prerogative of God. Also, to withhold forgiveness means we mock Christ's atonement and we don't trust him and that his justice will be meted out by him. So not forgiving others is a mockery of God's atonement. He who will not forgive wrote, others, wrote Spencer W. Kendall, breaks down the bridges over which he himself must travel. This is a truth taught by the Lord in the parable of the unmerciful servant, which you can see in Matthew 18, who demanded to be forgiven, but was merc merciless to one who also asked forgiveness of him. In a modern revelation, the Lord explained, My disciples in days of old sought occasion against one another, and forgave not one another in their hearts. And for this evil they were afflicted and sorely chastened. Wherefore I say unto you, that you ought to forgive one another. For he that forgiveth not his brother's trespasses stand condemned before the Lord. For there remaineth in him the greater sin. I, the Lord, will forgive whom I will forgive, but of you is required to forgive all men. And you ought to say in your hearts, Let God judge between me and thee, and reward thee according to thy deeds. I have been asked many times in 35 years of professional teaching for the church, Why, if I don't forgive somebody, I have committed the greater sin, when the sin someone committed against me could be fairly heinous? The reason is, like I said earlier, not forgiving makes a mockery of Christ's atonement. What you're saying to Jesus is, I don't trust you that you will bring justice eventually. And thus you mock his atonement. That is a greater sin, brothers and sisters. Chapter 26, verses 32 through 36, the phrase, their names were blotted out. Blotted out in Mosiah 26, 36 refers to excommunication. When a church member commits serious sin, the Lord's servants must take steps to assist the sinner through repentance. Sometimes this involves formal or informal church discipline. Elder Downey Chokes of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles explained, quote, Church discipline encourages members to keep the commandments of God. It is mere existence its mere existence stresses the seriousness and clarifies the meaning of the commandments of God. This is extremely important in an otherwise permissive society. The shepherd who has responsibility to protect the flock, that responsibility may require him to deny the sinner the fellowship of the saints or even to serve, sever his membership in the flock. As Jesus taught, if he repenteth not, he shall not be numbered among my people, that he may not destroy my people. For behold, I know my sheep and they are numbered. A part of the church judges, state presidents and bishops is to keep the church clean and pure. And sometimes they must do that by excommunication. President James E. Faust of the First Presidency identified offenses that warrant church discipline. Quote, church discipline is not limited to sexual sins, but includes other acts such as murder, abortion, burglary, theft, 
fraud, and other dishonest, deliberate disobedient, disobedience to the rules and regulations of the church, advocating or practicing polygamy, apostasy, or any other unchristian conduct, including defiance or ridicule of the Lord's anointed, contrary to the law of the Lord and the order of the church. Among the activities considered apostate at church include when members, one, repeatedly act in clear, open, and deliberate public opposition to church or its leaders. Two, persist in teaching as church doctrine information that is not church doctrine after being corrected by their bishops or higher authority. Or three, continue to follow the teachings of apostate cults, such as those that advocate plural message after being corrected by their bishops or higher authority. End of quote. In, 18, in 1985, the First Presidency issued an invitation for everyone to come back, which reminds us of our duty towards those who had had their names blotted out. Quote, we are aware of some who are inactive, others who have become critical and are prone to find fault, and those who have been disfellowshipped or excommunicated because of serious transgressions. To all such we reach out in love. We are anxious to forgive in the spirit of him who said, I the Lord will forgive whom I will forgive. But of you it is required to forgive all men. We encourage church members to forgive those who may have wronged them. To those who have seized activity and those who have become critical, we say, come back. Come back and feast at the table of the Lord and taste again the sweet and satisfying fruits of fellowship with the saints. We are confident that many have longed to return but have felt awkward about doing so. We assure you that you will find open arms to receive you and willing to hands to assist you. End of quote. Many times those who have been inactive or many don't come back because they feel, well, I just feel like I'm being judged by the members of the church if I come back. Well, brothers and sisters, isn't that a form of judgment? You're judging members of stuff you know nothing about. I guarantee you that most, if not all, members do not judge you for coming back. They glory in it and love you. I do not have time to judge you for your sins. I have to worry about my own. Do not think that you are that important, that everybody is constantly judging you of your unrighteous deeds. They are not. That is just a tool of Satan. Now, let's go to Mosiah chapter 27. 27 verses 1 through 3. The phrase, the persecutions which were inflicted on the church by the non-believers became so great that the church began to murmur. We claim the privilege of worshiping Almighty God according to the dictates of our own conscience and allow all men the same privilege. Let them worship how, where, or what they may. 11th article of faith. Again in the city of Zarahemla, the verity manifests itself that belief can tolerate the presence of unbelief and truth, and truth and the presence of error, but not the reverse. Isn't that interesting? Truth can tolerate non-truth, but not the reverse. The strength of the truth rests within itself, while error and falsehood must dominate their environment to survive. The spirit of one is peace. The spirit of another is contention. Persecution is often born of the fear of detection, while patience and long-suffering are born of the confidence of the spirit. So those who are in error or in sin cannot tolerate truth, while truth tolerates error in those under sin. 27 verse 4, the phrase every man should esteem his brother as himself meant, though salvation is an individual matter, it is a necessity a collective effort. We are saved as we help each other. He that findeth his life shall lose it, the Savior said, and he that loseth his life for my sake shall find it. Salvation is born of hum humble service, not of hidey isolation, of lifting, not of belittling, of loving, not of hating. There is only one plan of salvation, one system whereby men are saved. What I say unto one, I say unto all, the Lord has assured us. All the souls of men are of equal worth, and it is contrary to the Spirit of heaven for us to hold one in greater esteem than, a number, than another. 
I would say that even applies especially to those who hold significant callings. Just because someone is a bishop or state president doesn't make them more righteous than another. It just means they probably have certain things they need to learn, and the only way they can learn is by holding that office, and that they were probably foreordained to those offices before they came. That spirit that comes from God is without partiality and without hypocrisy. It regards the rich and the poor, the great and the small, with the same courtesy. Chapter 27, verse 7, the Lord did visit them, meant there is no reason to suppose that this statement does not mean precisely what it says, particularly when we remember what the Nephites, that the Nephites had the temple. Where might we ask where the Lord rather would be than among his own people? To those of our day, the Lord said, It shall come to pass that every soul who forsaketh his sins, and cometh unto me, and calleth on my name, and obey my voice, and keep my commandments, shall see my face and know that I am. A second sense in which such a statement would find application is the promise that where two or three are gathered together in my name as touching one thing, behold, there will I be in the midst of them. Even so am I in the midst of you. I am in your midst, the Lord said, and you cannot see me. The phrase and prosper them meant there is no need to hide from the fact that the scripture repeatedly affirmed that financial prosperity may follow the keeping of commandments of God. The promise of posterity, however, not be limited to temporal interpretation. So being prospered may refer to financial success, but not limited to that. For example, during the ministry of Helaman, the sons of Helaman, they were exceedingly great. There was there was exceedingly great prosperity in the church insomuch that there were thousands who did join themselves in the church and were baptized into repentance. See, so in that case, prosperity in the church meant that many joined the church and prospered. Alma 27, 18 through 17. Alma rehearsed this story in Alma 36 in respect of which a more detailed account commentary will be given. At this point, let us confine ourselves primarily to the question why Alma the Younger and the sons of Messiah were accorded a call to repent by an angel, when so many others who have left the church and warred against it do not appear to have been granted a like privilege. Some considerations would include the following. So why does Alma and the sons of Messiah have an angel to come and chastise them, while many others do not? First, it ought to be observed that if all rebellious souls were accounted a personal visit from an angel assuring the reality of the world to come with its rewards and punishment, there would be little need for faith on anyone's part. Second, such appearance of angels would create the temptation to obtain a testimony by negative behavior rather than through righteousness. Well, if I just sin, then I can see an angel be converted and Keep in, story, keep in mind the story, though, when the angel come, he just chastises them. It doesn't say that that's why they repented. Alma still had to choose to repent even after the angel had left. It wasn't because of the angel. Given that few among the faithful are privileged to enjoy the ministry of angels, it would seem a same strange system of theology than freely granted such a privilege to the wicked. Third, it could be that some appreciable number of people have had such an experience and have rejected the divine counsel and chosen not to repent, and thus we have no record of the experience. We know, for example, that Laman and Lamuel were rebuked by an angel, and they disregarded it, and there's no evidence that they ever recorded such things. So there may be many accounts throughout history of where angels came and chastised people, and they did not repent. We just do not have a record of it. Fourth, the Savior explained that those who reject the testimony of Scripture and the living prophets would also reject the testimony of the angels were they up to appear unto them. Like I said, it wasn't because angels came that Alma repented. It's because in his comatose state, he was suffering hell and losing his very soul. And in that moment, he realized the words of his father and the words of Christ. Fifth, we have the testimony of Scripture that some have entertained angels unaware, and we might suppose that in many instances angels have sought to incentivize transgressors from their course in a 
um, in unobserved or less dramatic ways than this appearance to Alma and the sons of Mosiah. So maybe there have been many times angels have helped, but people have just not been aware of it in their lives. Sixth, the prayers of the righteous cannot go unheard. Alma the elder and Mosiah were both men of great faith, who no doubt implored the heavens night and day with a plea of help to save their wayward sons. Nor did they pray alone, for their pleadings were joined by those of all the faithful of the church in and around Zarahemla. Seventh, in need to remember that the Lord... It, it need be remembered that the Lord, who can manifest his power in a great variety of ways, is hardly limited to angelic ministrations or open visions. Many have had conversion experiences of spiritual impact and consequence equal to Alma's experiences, which are the results of a coalescence of circumstances divinely contrived. Life-changing experiences involving such things as confrontation with death, or inspired sermon, a caring parent or relative, or a sensitive priesthood leader. Chapter, uh, Mosiah chapter 27, verse 14, the phrase, an angel sent from God. One of the roles of an angel fulfills is to call the wicked to repentance. Note that the angel did not come to Alma and the four sons of Mosiah because of their righteousness, but that the prayers of his servants might be answered according to their faith. The ministry of angels must be in harmony with the will of God and does not always occur according to the timetable of the petitioner. Speaking of a man who had prayed for the visitation of angels, President Wilford Woodruff said, quote, I said to him, if he were to pray a thousand years to the God of Israel for that gift, it would not be granted unless the Lord had a motive in sending an angel to him. I told him that the Lord never did nor never will send an angel to anybody merely to gratify the desire of the individual to see an angel. If the Lord sends angels to anyone, he sends him to perform a work that cannot be formed only by the administration of an angel. I said to him that those were my views. The Lord had sent angels to men from the creation of the world at different times, but always with a message or with something to perform that could not be performed without. I rever rehearsed to him different times when angels appeared to men. Of course, I referred to him the angel visiting Joseph Smith. The revelator John said in the last days an angel would fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to them that dwell upon the earth. The reason it required an angel to do this work was the gospel was not on the earth. The gospel and the priesthood had been taken from among men. Hence, God had to restore it again. And he does that through the ministering of angels. That that wasn't part of the quote. That was my addition. Continuing Wolf, President Wolfer's quote. Now, I have always said, and I want to say it to you, that the Holy Ghost is whatever saint, the, that the Holy Ghost is whatever saint of God needs. It is far more important that a man should have the, that gift than he should have the ministering of angels, unless it is necessary for an angel to teach him something that he has not been taught. Chapter 27, 8 to 36, just that prior last quote, President Wilford Woodruff was trying to say that the greater gift is the gift of the Holy Ghost. That is what we should be praying for and seeking our guidance and direction. 8 through 36, sin and iniquity can be dealt with in two ways. One, a person may seek to cover his sins instead of seeking repentance. Or two, a person may seek to repent and have the Savior cover his sins with his robes of righteousness. As Nephi states, quote, Oh, how great the plan of our God. For on the one hand, the paradise of our God must deliver up the spirits of the righteous and the grave deliver up the body of the righteous. And the spirit and the body is restored to itself again. And all men become incorrupt corruptible and immortal, and they are living souls, having a perfect knowledge like unto us in the flesh, save it be that our knowledge shall be perfect. Wherefore, we shall have a perfect knowledge of all our guilt and our uncleanliness and our nakedness, and the righteous shall have a perfect knowledge of their enjoyment and their righteousness, being clothed with purity, yea, even with the robes of righteousness. Brothers and sisters, don't seek to cover your sins, because they will always be exposed at the last day. But seek to have Christ's robes of righteousness to cover our sins, and then God will remember them no more. 
From the story of Alma the Younger and the four sons of Mosiah, we learn what the symptoms or fruits are for those who seek to cover their sins versus those who seek repentance in the following chart. Symptoms or fruits of those who try to cover their sins. 1 and verse 8, use of flattery to lead people after their iniquities and to justify their actions. 2 and verse 9, they cause dissension from the truth. 3 verse 10, their work is done in secret so as to appear, appear authentic. 4 verse 11, rebellion against God and his teachings. And 5, verse 31, they will face the judgments of God and come to confess that Jesus is the Christ and that the judgments of an everlasting judgment is just upon them. And they shall quake and tremble and shrink beneath the glancing of his all-searching eye. Now, here are the fruits or the symptoms of those who repent. Verse 24, they become born again and putting off the natural man. Verse 25, they change from their carnal fallen state to a state of righteousness, submitting to the will of God, becoming his sons and daughters. Verse 26, they become new creatures in Christ, putting off the old natural man. Verse 28, willing to wade through affliction as a part of the repentance process. Number 5, verse 29, they receive the light of God and are pained no more by the guilt of their sins. And number six, verse 30, they ex the acceptance of Christ as the Redeemer and that he will come again. So you can tell quickly by the two sides, am I trying to cover my sins or am I getting Christ to cover my sins through repentance? And number seven, verse 30 to 35, the willingness to repair any damage or injury done to their sins, confessing their sins and teaching the truth of the word of God. In 8, verse 36 to 37, they become instruments in the hands of God in bringing people to a knowledge of the truth and publish peace. Chapter 27, verse 8, the phrase, after the manner of his iniquities. Consequently, the doctrines or philosophies of those trying to lead members of the church astray seek to justify a downward course. Inevitably, their appeal is in abandoning covenants and standards. Verse 27, verse 12, the phrase, understood not the words which he spake unto them, meant obviously the message became understood. It would appear, however, that the first words spoken by the angel were not comprehended. This same expression is used to describe the first two instances in which the risen Lord spoke to the more righteous part of the Nephites. They understood it not. So Alma and the Four Sons of Maya probably didn't understand the words at the very first when he spoke to them. Chapter 27, verse 13, the phrase, Nothing shall overthrow it save transgression. We would understand this statement to mean that the Nephite church could not be destroyed by external influences. Indeed, it appears that in past dispensations, most notably the meridian of time, meaning the time of Christ, when the church had been lost, the cause had been wickedness and error within the church rather than opposition from without. Brothers and sisters, we have the promise that nothing shall overthrow this church save the transgression of its people. This church can be completely, totally lost and the Savior not save it if we in the church so choose that path as a group of people. Chapter 26, verse 16, the phrase, If thou wilt of thyself be cast off, meant this is not a threat on Alma's mortal life, but a solemn warning relative to the eternal welfare of his soul. Chapter 27, verses 22 through 23, the ministering to those who have strayed. One of the chief duties God requires of those he calls to serve is to help those who have strayed come back to the fold. While serving in the 70, Elder Theodore M. Burton shared his feelings about this sacred work. Quote, I have been asked the question, isn't it depressing to have to review the sins and transgressions of people involved in such difficulties? It would be if I were looking for sins and transgressions, but I am working with people who are repenting. These are sons and daughters of God who have made mistakes, some of them very serious, but they are not sinners. 
They were sinners in the past, but have learned through bitter experience the heartbreak that results from the disobedient to God's laws. Now they are no longer sinners. They are God's repentant children who want to come back to Him and are striving to do so. They have made their mistakes and have paid for them. Now they seek understanding, love, and acceptance. End of quote. Chapter 27, verse 24, the phrase, I have repented of my sins. This statement followed three days and three nights in which Alma's soul was, in his own words, racked with eternal torment. He suffered the pains of hell and inexpressible horror. He experienced the gall of bitterness and was encircled about by the everlasting chains of death. Alma's experience dramatized the fact that clearly confession cannot supplant the need for the experience of repentance. This shows that true repentance is more than just simply confessing. Remember, redeemed of the Lord, the phrase redeemed of the Lord, meant because of Christ's atonement, Alma could, through his own repentance, which repentance embraced a most exquisite punishment, be redeemed of the Lord. That is, he could be freed from the dominion and power of Satan to enjoy the peace and love of heaven. I have had some students in my 35 years of teaching make the mistake and say, God, I would like to only be forgiven in three days of all my sins, but I think they're mistaking what Alma went through. He is going through hell, and he literally thought his soul was going to be destroyed. For three days, he was racked with that eternal torment. No, I would not want that. I would not wish that plan upon anyone. I will take the plan I have been given to repent of my sins one by one as they come. I would not want to go through what Alma experienced at all. The inexpressible horror, the eternal torment, his soul racked with pain. Chapter 27, verse 24. I am born of the Spirit. As the man is sin is to die and be buried in the watery grave of baptism, thus allowing his spirit to come forth into a newness of life, so Alma came forth, as it were, from his own grave with a new spirit. Alma, whose life had been consumed with wickedness, was a prisoner released from the prison seeking to right the wrongs of his life. Please, brothers and sisters, let's get this baptism imagery correct. Baptism does not wash away sins. Children don't have any sins. And even converts who later are being baptized, it's the Holy Ghost that burns sin out of us. Baptism, the symbolism is the watery grave. It's symbolic of the grave and being resurrected, being buried, the old man, and coming forth is the new man. Let's stop this symbolism at these baptismal ceremonies and say, saying to these young kids, you are about to have your sins washed away. That is not the symbolism. They are about to go down and come forth a new person and promising to be a new person. And thence from there, the Holy Ghost takes their sins away if they avail themselves of repentance. Chapter 27, verse 25. The phrase, all nations, kindreds, tongues, and people must be born again. There is but one Lord, one faith, and one system of salvation. Those of all nations, kindreds, tongues, those of all ages of earth's history are redeemed by the same atonement, must profess the same Savior, and comply with the same laws and ordinances if they are to be saved. It is because of this very principle that the doctrines of the Book of Mormon are timeless in value. Adam had to keep the same ordinances. So did Abraham, so did Isaac, so did Jacob, so did Isaiah, so did Elijah. No matter what dispensation, the ordinances and covenants are all the same. Chapter 27, verse 25, the phrase, being born again. President Ezra Taft Benson gave us an important reminder as we seek to be born again and become like unto our Savior. Quote, we must be careful as we seek to become more and more godlike that we do not become discouraged and lose hope. Becoming Christ-like like is a lifetime pursuit and very often involves growth and changes that is slow, almost imperceptible. The scriptures record remarkable accounts of men whose lives changed dramatically in an instance, as it were. Alma the Younger, Paul on the road to Damascus, Enos praying far into the night, King Lamoni. Such astonishing examples of power to change, even those steeped in sin, give confidence that the atonement can reach even those deepest in despair. 
But we must be cautious as we discuss these remarkable examples. Though they are real and powerful, they are the exception more than the rule. Let me repeat that. President Benson said, they are the exception more than the rule. For every Paul, for every Enos, for every King Lamoni, there are hundreds and thousands of people who find the process of repentance much more subtle, much more imperceptible. Day by day, they move closer to the Lord, little realizing they are building a godlike life. They live quiet lives of goodness, service, and commitment. They are like the Lamanites who the Lord said were baptized with fire and with the Holy Ghost, and they knew it not. So please do not seek for an exceptional experience. That is the exception, not the rule, brothers and sisters. And you'll only disappoint, be disappointed that it probably will not come as some great thing. But when you do get converted little by little and simply by simply, it will be a marvelous great thing. Elder Downley H. Oaks discussed the meaning of being born again. Quote, the question of whether a person has been saved and sometimes phrased in terms of whether that person has been born again. Being born again is a familiar reference in the Bible and the Book of Mormon. As noted earlier, Jesus taught that except a man be born again of water and of the Spirit, he could not enter into the kingdom of God. The Book of Mormon has many teachings about the necessity of being born again or born of God. As we understand these scriptures, our answer to whether we have been born again is clearly yes. We have been born again when we enter into a covenant relationship with our Savior by being born of water and of the Spirit and by taking upon us the name of Christ. We can renew that rebirth each Sabbath when we partake of the sacrament. Latter-day Saints affirm that those who have been born again in this way are spiritually begotten sons and daughters of Jesus Christ. Nevertheless, in order to realize the intended blessings of this born-again status, we must still keep our covenants endure to the end. In the meantime, through the grace of God, we have been born again as new creatures with new spiritual parentage and the prospects of a glorious inheritance. End of quote. Chapter 27, verse 28, the phrase repenting nigh unto death. Just punishment must also be commensurate with the seriousness of the sin. As God's punishments must be appropriate to the offense, so the depth of one's repentance must be in proper proportion to the grievousness of the transgression. Given that Alma and his colleagues in carnality were the very vilest of sinners, they must fully feel the burden or weight of their repentance before they could enjoy the glorious miracle of forgiveness. So our punishment will be in proportion to the degree of our sin. Chapter 27, verse 28, the phrase, after much tribulation cometh the blessings. Though Alma the Younger had to wade through much tribulation, the end result was his experience, of his experience was exquisite and exceeding joy. As Jeffrey R. Holland explained, we must realize that the pride of sin is high and that though repentance can be difficult, the end result is always worth much more than the cost. He said, quote, we learn that repentance is a very painful process. By its own admission, Alma said he waded through much tribulation, repenting nigh unto death, that he was consumed with an everlasting birth burning. I was in the darkest abyss, he said. My soul was racked with eternal torment. For three seemingly endless days and nights, he was torn with the pains of a damned soul, pain so real that he was physically incapacitated and spiritually terrorized by what appeared to be his ultimate fate. No one should think that the gift of forgiveness is fully realized without significant effort on the part of the forgiven. No one should be foolish enough to sin willingly or wantonly, Thinking forgiveness is easily available. Now, the, I, I, I pause in this quote for a minute. We should not prodigally sin, meaning sinning knowing that I can repent later. That would not be sincere repentance. Continuing this quote, Repentance of necessity involves suffering and sorrow, and who thinks otherwise has not read the life of Alma the Younger, nor tried personally to repent. In the process of repentance, we are granted just a taste of the suffering we would endure if we would fail to turn from evil.
That pain through the only moment, mo moment Momentary for the repentant is the most bitter of cups. No man or woman should be foolish enough to think it can be sipped even briefly without consequences. We learn that when repentance is complete, we are born again and leave behind forever the self we once were. To me, none of the many, to me, none of the many approaches to teaching repentance falls more short than the well-intended suggestion that although a nail may be removed from a wooden post, there will forever be a hole in that post. We know that repentance, the removal of the nail, if you will, can be a very long and painful and difficult task. Unfortunately, some will never have the incentive to undertake it. We even know that there are very few sins for which no repentance is possible. But where repentance is possible and its requirements are faithfully pursued and completed, there is no hole left in the post. For the bold reason that it is no longer the same post, it is a new post. We can start again utterly clean with with a new will and a new way of life end of quote oh what hope that sweet sentence gives chapter 29 verse chapter 27 verse 29 the phrase redeemed from the gall of bitterness our first scriptural reference to gall of bitterness and poisonous herbs is found in Deuteronomy 29.18, where it is used as a metaphor to describe the spiritual state of those who turn from the God of Israel to embrace idolatry. The phrase Moses used was gall and wormwood. Wormwood was also a plant with a bitter taste. The doctrine being taught by Alma's comment is that to leave righteousness and truth, to embrace wickedness and falsehood, embitters and poisons the soul towards those covenants that have been abandoned. Thus it is to be expected that those leaving the church to satiate carnal appetites will not be able to remain neutral toward it, but rather will will be characterized by a bitter and poisonous spirit. Alma was a classic example of this consequence, and here announces that he has been freed from this spirit of bitterness, meaning that once you leave the church, you don't the bitterness stays and you're constantly being bitter against it. The phrase, my soul was racked with eternal torment, meant in this instance, eternal torment lasted three days. Eternal is a name of deity and is being used in such, in, in such text. Thus, the reference is to the quality of the torment, godly torment, rather than its quantity or duration. So when he said he was racked with eternal torment, it doesn't mean it went on forever. He says he's being racked with godly torment since eternal is a name of God. Chapter 27, verse 30, the phrase, He will make himself manifest unto all. All men are responsible to accept God, his prophets, and his gospel. The means of obtaining knowledge of those things is born with them. Further, all things testify of him, and to reject such testimony is to walk in darkness by choice. 27, verse 31, Every knee shall bow. After the final resurrection, when even those who are filthy still have come forth from the grave to have body and spirit inseparably united, after this gospel has gone forth to those of every nation, kindred, tongue, and people, then shall be the sound of this trump, saying to all people, both in heaven and earth, and that are under the earth, for every ear shall hear it, and every knee shall bow, and every tongue shall confess, while they hear the sound of the trump, saying, Fear God and give glory to him who sitteth upon the throne forever and ever, for the hour of his judgment is come. Then will come the judgment of all mankind. Chapter 27, verses 32 through 37. From this point forward, Alma and the four sons of Mosiah, Ammon, Aaron, Omner, and Himni, labored without ceasing in the service of God. Well, might it be said of them, as the apostle said of himself, I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. Their devout labors proved to do, proved the genuineness of their conversion. 
Truly they brought forth fruit unto repentance. Thus we apply to them as we do to the Apostle Paul the doctrine of James, which is, He which converteth the sinner from the error of his way shall, have a soul, a sa shall save a soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sins. The hidden sins belonging to the one doing the labor of conversion. Announcing this principle to those of our day, the Lord said, For I will forgive your sins with this commandment, that you remain steadfast in your minds and solemnity and the spirit of prayer and bearing testimony to all the world of those things which are communicated unto you. Let's now finish up with Mosiah chapter 28. 28 verse 1, the phrase that they might preach the things which they had heard. The desire to serve and a rightful commission to serve are not one and the same thing. It is for God to choose or for God to send those whom he has chosen. Because this house is a house of order, such calls must come under the direction of those he has called to direct and administer the affairs of the kingdom here on earth. That would be the first presence in the twelve. Thus, the sons of Mosiah, now truly converted, seek the right to preach the gospel to the Lamanites. The idea that they could do so without the blessing of Mosiah does not even occur to them. Mosiah, in turn, would not grant such a commission until he obtained the mind and will of the Lord on the matter. Chapter 28, verse 2, the phrase that there should be no more contention in all the land. There is not, nor can there be, any lasting peace among men or nations until that peace is founded upon the principles of righteousness. No treaty can establish anything more than a ten tenuous and temporary peace among such nations as the Nephites and the Lamanites. A change of heart is necessary if amity and harmony, am amity and harmony are to exist. Only the waters of baptism can permanently wash away the seeds of hatred and contention, bringing in their place life and love and peace. Brothers and sisters, we are not going to become a peaceful people upon the earth and the land because of peace treaties of nations. It will be because of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Chapter 28, verse 3, the phrase salvation should be declared to every creature. President Howard W. Hunter described how desire to share the gospel is a natural result of personal conversion. Quote, there is the example of the four sons of Mosiah, Ammon, Om, Aaron, Omni, Omner, and Himni, who received a forgiveness of sin through the atonement and then labored for years among the Lamanites to bring them to Christ. The rector states that they could not bear the thought that any soul should perish. A great indicator of one's personal conversion is the desire to share the gospel with others. For this reason, the Lord gave an obligation to every member of the church to be missionaries. End of quote. Elder Russ, M. Russell Ballard of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles suggested one effective way church members could share the gospel today. Quote, the key to successful member missionary work is the exercise of faith. One way to show your faith in the Lord and his promise is to prayerfully set a date to have someone prepared to meet with the missionaries. I have received hundreds of letters from members who have exercised their faith in this simple way. Even though families had no one in mind with whom they could share the gospel, they set a day, a date, prayed, and then talked to many more people. The Lord is the good shepherd, and he knows his sheep who have been prepared to hear his voice. He will guide us as we seek his divine help in sharing his gospel. End of quote. Chapter 28, verse 3. The phrase, they could not bear that any human soul should perish. Describing that same spirit known to the sons of Mosiah, President Joseph F. Smith, reflecting on the spirit associated with his own baptism, recalled, quote, The feeling that came upon me was that of pure peace, of love, and of light. I felt in my soul that if I had sinned, and surely I was not without sin, that it had been forgiven me, and that I was indeed cleansed from my sin. My heart was touched, and I felt that I would not injure the smallest insect beneath my feet. I felt as if I wanted to do good everywhere, to everybody, and to everything. I felt a newness of life, a newness of desire to do that which was right. There was not one particle of desire for evil left in my soul. End of quote. Chapter 28, verse 4, the phrase, Nevertheless, they suffered much anguish of soul. As there is more to seeking forgiveness than making an apology, so there is more to repentance than simply profession that one loves Jesus. 
Our garments are not cleansed from the stain of serious sin with so little scrubbing. The promise in Doctrine and Covenants 19, 16-19 is that if we repent, we will not have to suffer as the Savior did. However, some personal suffering is part of the repentance process. Chapter 28, verse 7, the phrase, they shall have eternal life. It is not entirely clear in the present text whether those being promised eternal life are the Lamanites who embrace the faith or Mosiah's sons who serve in faith. It is axiomatic that those who accept the message of the salvation and conform their lives thereto will eventually inherit eternal life. Of special interest in the context of our present story, however, are the many passages that promise eternal life to the faithful missionary. One of the first revelations given in our dispensation announced that those who go forth in the name of the Lord must serve with all their heart, might, mind, and strength, that they might stand blameless before him at the day of judgment. The revelation promised that those so laboring that through such service they may lay up in store that they perish not but bring salvation to their own souls. That is simply to say that we serve to work out our own salvation. The sons of Mosiah were very much in need of the opportunity to render such service. So a part of working out our own salvation is helping others work out their salvation by teaching the gospel. Chapter 28, verses 11 through 20, the Jaredite record and seer stones. President Joseph Filling Smith discussed Mosiah's use of the interpreters in translating the Jaredite records. The quote, the people of Limhi brought to Mosiah a record engraved on plates of ore, which record Mosiah translated by the aid of two stones which were fastened into the two rims of a bow. Joseph Smith received with the breastplate and the plates of the Book of Mormon the Urim and Thummim, which were hid up by Moroni to come forth in the last days as a means by which ancient records might be translated, which Urim and Thummim were given to the brother of Jared. End of quote. Brothers and sisters, Joseph Smith said, I translated the Book of Mormon by the gift and power of God. And we know that one of the gifts and powers given to him was the Urim and Thummim. The old seer stone story and in looking into a hat was made up by David Whitmer, who apostatized in the church and tries to discredit and make Joseph look foolish. Joseph translated the gift by the gift and power of God, the Book of Mormon, with the aid of the Urim and Thummim. Chapter 28, verse 11, the phrase, plates of gold. These were 24 gold plates containing the record of the Jaredites. Remember that Limhi's people found as they were trying to look for Jerahamla, but couldn't find it, but came upon the desolate Jaredite nation. Chapter 28, verse 13, two stones fastened into the rim, two rims of a bow. When Moroni told Joseph Smith the responsibility that would be his in translating the Book of Mormon, he explained the that secreted with the plates upon which the book was written, Joseph would find two transparent stones in a silver bow fastened to a breastplate. Moroni said that these two that these stones were what the ancients called the Yerman Thummim, and that their use constituted one a seer. The things are called interpreters, and no man can look in them except he be commanded, lest he should look for that he ought not, and he should perish. And whosoever is commanded to look in them, the same is called seer. Joseph thus was a seer because he had the yerm and thummim. Elder Bruce R. McConkie states, quote, Because of the sacred nature of these holy instruments, they have not been viewed by most men, and even the times and circumstances in which they have been held by mortals are not clearly set forth. Undoubtedly, they were in use before the flood, but the first scriptural reference to them is in connection with the revelation given the brother of Jared. Abraham had them in his day, and Aaron and the priest of Israel had them from generation to generation. End of quote. Chapter 28, verse 14. These things were prepared from the beginning and were handed down from generation to generation. 
In some instances, this divine interpreter and revelatory device, the Urim and Thummim, has been handed down from generation to generation. In others, apparently, it had been used for specific purposes and then revert, returned to Heavenly Messenger from whence it came. Scriptural references verify its use by the prophets in the Old World and the New World. We have no way of knowing how many different Urim and Thummims may be used at various times. That will be interesting someday to get the history of all of this, won't it? Chapter 28, verse 15, the phrase that he should discover to every creature who should possess the land the iniquities and abominations of his people. The Urim and Thummim is one means by which the Lord can give a panoramic perspective, the means by which all things, including the evil and abominations of the day, can be made known to his servants, the prophets. Thereby, those prophets can clearly judge and discern good from evil and provide the necessary warning and admonition to their people. It could even be that President Nelson, who we sustain as prophet, seer, and revelator, has access as needed to the Urim and Thummim to fulfill his calling. Chapter 28, verse 19, It is expedient that all people should know the things which were written in this account meant. This is in reference to the 24 gold plates that the people of Limhi found later known as the Book of Ether. There is no knowledge of God or the plan of salvation that is distinctive or particular particular to the book of either. The Jeredot record is intended as a confirming and sustaining account of the doctrines and teachings found in the Nephite record. Thank you for watching. Hopefully this helped in some of the doctrines and principles teachings found in these chapters. If you found it helpful, hit the like button.